Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part one of our three-part immuno-oncology series. Today's live broadcast, Deciphering the Cancer Immunity Cycle Through Next Generation Sequencing, is presented by Dr. Simon Colley, Head of Software and Bioinformatics for the IAM Torrent Next Generation Sequencing Platform. I'm Alexis Kraus of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots, and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Simon Colley. Dr. Simon Colley is a head of software and bioinformatics for the Ion Torrent Next Generation Sequencing Platform. As part of the Clinical Sequencing Division of Thermo Fisher Scientific, his team is responsible for the full bioinformatics workflow from acquisition and processing of raw data off the semiconductor chip to delivery of downstream analytics and biological insights. Prior to working with the Ion Torrent platform, Dr. Colley spent 10 years at Affymetrics as head of algorithms and data analysis for expression, genotyping, and other applications. Dr. Colley has a PhD in statistics from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in mathematics from Trinity College, Dublin. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Colley, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks very much for the introduction, uh, and I'd like to thank all of the audience for joining us today and giving me the opportunity to discuss with you some of the solutions that we at Thermo Fisher Scientific have been developing for research into uh, the immuno-oncology space. So we believe there's a huge opportunity for the application of next generation sequencing to immuno-oncology, and that it's gonna open the doors to further characterizing the complexities of immuno-oncology, including the tumor microenvironment and biomarkers that might exist there. Improved biomarkers have the potential to predict who will respond to immune therapy, leading in turn to more effective patient selection strategies and more successful outcomes of immuno-oncology trials. New biomarkers may also have the ability to predict predisposition to adverse events, which will enable people who are candidates for immuno-oncology uh, therapy to make knowing decisions about their risks should they elect to go ahead with checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, furthermore, Due to their high accuracy and sensitivity, next-generation sequencing assays can also help in researching areas beyond the checkpoint blockade. We expect T-cell receptor sequencing to help accelerate development and improve effectiveness for approaches such as uh, chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapies and cancer vaccines. The cancer immunity cycle is very complex and it needs to be studied from multiple angles. Uh, the figure shown here, it's from a 2013 cell publication by Chen and Melman, and it provides an overview of the cancer immunity cycle. It begins uh, in the lower left with the release of cancer cell antigens into the tumor microenvironment uh, upon cancer cell death. Those antigens get taken up by antigen-presenting cells, and they're brought to the lymph node where T cells are primed and activated. The activated T cells are released to the bloodstream, and they're trafficked to the tumor where they infiltrate the tumor and they recognize the cancer cells, leading to cell death and restarting the cycle again. There's multiple elements in the cycle here that can be monitored to characterize tumor immune interactions. Uh, these include uh, sequencing of T cell receptors to profile the status of the immune repertoire. They include studying the immune response within the tumor microenvironment itself via characterization of RNA expression. And they include the molecular profiling of the cancer cells within the tumor microenvironment 
look for driver mutations and other biomarkers such as tumor mutation burden. Tumor immune in interactions are very complex and there's not one perfect biomarker for uh, predicting different events of interest. And we believe that the best approach is going to uh, require multi-dimensional uh, views of the data where uh, multiple biomarkers are uh, considered together. To address the needs, uh, we've developed an extensive portfolio of next-generation sequencing-based solutions to enable these kinds of multi-dimensional approaches to research in the cancer immunity cycle. Uh, some of the products uh, I will be speaking about today include the Oncomine T-cell receptor beta long-read assay, uh, or LR assay, uh, the TCR beta SR, or short-read assay, the immune response research assay, and the tumor mutation load assay. I'll go into more detail on those four solutions in the remainder of the presentation, but before doing so, I just wanted to show first how they fit within our broader and continually growing uh, oncology portfolio. Uh, we break down our solutions into four different categories. We have a range of solutions for uh, solid tumor research, so FFP optimized solutions, including both uh, focused panels, cancer-specific panels, uh, and comprehensive panels. We've arranged range of solutions for uh, liquid biopsy applications, so for the study of cell-free uh, DNA uh, in, in blood. Again, we have a mix there of panels that are specific to certain cancer types, uh, and earlier this year we uh, launched a pan-cancer uh, cell-free assay. Then we have the immuno-oncology solutions that I'll be speaking to in the rest of this presentation. Uh, and lastly, we have uh, panels focused on the study of heme oncology um, our myeloid research assay, and our childhood cancer research assay. There are some distinct advantages associated uh, in, with the way that we configure our next generation solutions, next generation sequencing solutions. Uh, all the solutions that I'm showing here, they're supported on our automated IonChef and Gene Studio S5 systems. They involve very limited hands-on time and a high degree of automation, which makes for very fast and highly reproducible workflows. The systems are easy to deploy and easy to validate, and that saves time and money relative to considering alternate approaches that may involve the use of multiple different systems. Uh, we also offer pre-configured and integrated bioinformatics analysis for these solutions, and that gets you all the way through your workflow to meaningful answers for your applications making it accessible for people who aren't necessarily bioinformatics experts uh, to enable them to get to the answer that they need. But also for the people who are bioinformatics experts, we make it uh, easy to get into the raw data and to uh, pursue different kinds of analyses or use of different third-party tools uh, for people who want to do that. And lastly, uh, all the solutions that I'm talking about here today are based on the ION AmpliSeq technology. Uh, and so they come with all the advantages mentioned above, uh, as well as providing high sensitivity, very low error rate, and uh, one of the fastest next generation sequencing workflows available. So I'll move on now to discuss the first of the four immuno-oncology assays that I'll be talking about today, the Oncomine T-cell receptor beta long read assay, or LR assay. So the TCR beta LR assay, it's a unique solution for profiling uh, T cell receptor beta immune repertoires. In humans, about 95% of the T cells carry alpha beta receptors, and among these, the beta chain is the most informative. The remaining 5% of the T cell population has gamma delta receptors, which aren't the subject of discussion here today. Uh, the assay is unique in that it uses the established AmpliSeq technology to capture the complementarity determining region, or CDR1, 2, and 3, of the T cell receptor uh, uh, beta VDJ re rearrangements in cDNA. So like some other immune repertoire assays, the Oncomine TCR beta long read assay uses the highly diverse CDR3 region of TCR beta re rearrangements to identify the T cell clone and to measure common repertoire metrics like uh, richness, clonality, diversity, and so on. Uh, but in addition, we found that the use of our long read sequencing uh, and the study of the CDR1 and 2 regions 
uh, provides valuable extra information. So unlike the CDR3 region, uh, CDR1 and 2 are not the product of somatic recombination, rather they are germline in origin, and they can be used to investigate predisposition to adverse events to a particular immunotherapy, uh, as allelic variants in CDR1 and 2 can alter interactions with uh, HLA. Like all the ion amplisic based assays, this assay has very low and flexible input requirements. Uh, it can go down to as low as uh, one uh, nanogram of input. So uh, the TCR beta assay can also be viewed as another kind of solution for liquid biopsies. The term liquid biopsy typically refers to the analysis of tumor cells or their products from peripheral fluids such as blood or urine. Uh, and to date, the most common liquid biopsy application has been the study of cell-free DNA in peripheral blood. Uh, the diagram on the right highlights the results of centrifugation of peripheral blood. Uh, this separates the sample into plasma, uh, buffy coat, and erythrocytes. Plasma can be used for cell-free DNA sequencing uh, while the buffy coat fraction containing peripheral blood leukocytes, or PBLs, can be used for T cell receptor beta sequencing. Uh, this buffy coat is often unutilized in uh, many lab workflows, and it presents a valuable additional source of liquid biopsy information that uh, in many situations is, is just discarded. Uh, Tumor-specific T cells are primed by tumor antigens in the lymph nodes and enter into the peripheral blood before infiltrating the tumor which is why this is a, a sample of uh, great interest for studying uh, uh, tumors. So one can measure T cell responses to the tumor by sequencing PBLs, and that can provide predict predictive information regarding immune-mediated adverse events and uh, responses to immunotherapy. So I'll move on now to discuss a related assay, the TCR-beta short read, or SR assay. So like the long read assay, the short read assay enables characterization of T cell receptors use, using a short amplicon strategy that probes the CDR3 region exclusively. The use of short amplicons enables the use of the panel with FFP samples, whose RNA and DNA are typically degraded to varying degrees. And the ability to work with degraded FFP samples makes this panel ideal for studying the immune repertoire in the tumor microenvironment. As with the long read assay, it's got flexible input requirements, and it comes with pre-configured, optimized bioinformatics capabilities. One of the primary application areas for the TCR beta short read assay is the study of the tumor microenvironment, which contains cell types that can contribute to immune evasion by inhibiting anti-tumor response of effector cells. These cell types include uh, effector cells, which are short-lived activated cells that defend the body in an immune response. It also includes immunosuppressive cell types, such as regulatory T cells or Tregs, uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and tumor-associated macrophages. The T cells in the tumor microenvironment can be studied with the TCR-beta short read assay. Some of the other cell types can be characterized by the immune response assay, which I'll be describing uh, in a little bit. I'd like to add some comments here also on the use of RNA versus DNA as input to the short read assay, since the assay is compatible with both types of input. Uh, where FFP sample quality permits, if the DNA isn't too degraded and the RNA isn't too degraded, uh, we believe that working with RNA has some advantages. Uh, one advantage is that for the same total input mass, use of RNA rather than DNA will typically yield uh, a better and broader representation of the underlying repertoire, because to begin with, the source material is itself more targeted. Um, another advantage of using RNA as input is that at analysis time, uh, we can make the assumption that the reads are coming from full-length productive RNA sequences. Uh, so in other words, mathematically, we can assume that the length of all of the sequence, sequences should be a multiple of three. Uh, and that allows us to perform some informatics-based error corrections to achieve extremely high accuracies uh, when using RNA as input. In situations uh, where the RNA from FFP is too degraded, uh, uh, DNA may end up being more effective. So it's something that uh, uh, people may wish to uh, consider, possibly try both approaches and, and, and see which one works best. So 
So uh, the assay works well across a broad range of T cell contents. The examples on, shown on top here are from tonsil, FFP, RNA, and DNA on the, uh, the left and the right. Uh, and both of these samples have relatively rich and relatively even repertoires. Uh, the figures shown here, the histograms are showing the distribution of the read lengths. Uh, and the darker figures, uh, I'll, I'll be explaining their, their spectrotyping plots. I'll explain those in a little more detail in a few slides. Uh, on, uh, on the bottom are two examples that have low T cell content. So on the left is a lung FFP DNA sample. It has just under 100 clones detected within it. And you can note the more quantized histogram of the read lengths due to the lower diversity uh, in the repertoire. Uh, and on the right is an example from cell-free DNA. Uh, now, with the use of cell-free DNA, it's, there, there is uh, relatively little uh, target amplifiable material in the sample type. And so we do tend to get a larger number of off-target reads which is what is causing some of that larger peak to the right in the, in the read length histogram. So the Oncomine TCR beta short read assay can also be used for research in the detection of post-remission recurrence of T cell malig malignancies. So in situations where malignant clones have been characterized upfront by repertoire profiling pretreatment, then post-remission uh, use of this assay uh, can lead to the analysis of samples to look for recurrence of those malignant clones. Uh, and for this kind of application, we focused on configuring uh, the solution so that it can achieve uh, very sensitive limits of detection. Uh, and we've demonstrated down to being able to detect one in 100,000 clones. So to go into a little more detail on that, Minimal or sometimes measurable residual disease uh, refers to situations where a small number of malign malignant cells can remain after treatment, possibly leading to future recurrence. Uh, an example of this would be T cell non Hodgkin's lymphoma, in which the sample type is going to be either peripheral blood or, or bone marrow. And despite the fact that DNA quality will typically be good in this sample type, we do recommend use of the short read assay with DNA as input as it's going to enable the assay to be more quantitative, which is, which is what we want in this kind of application. Uh, it's critical to appropriately set the amount of input DNA being used and to uh, set the total number of sequencing reads to achieve uh, the desired limit of detection. The typical limit of detection uh, that is often targeted would be in the range of 1 in 10,000, uh, which is often associated with higher risk of relapse, or one in 100,000, which is often associated with uh, much lower risk, risks of relapse. Uh, the lower limit of detection can require as much as a microgram of, in, of input and can require uh, multiple sequencing replicates. Uh, extreme sensitivity is required for this application. So when we released the short read assay earlier this year, we released it uh, with support for the use of dual barcodes with the samples. Uh, and this avoids problems with barcode contamination, sometimes also called index hopping, uh, which would be otherwise very detrimental to this uh, kind of application. So I'll move on now to discuss uh, the bioinformatics solutions that we have in place in our software package Ion Reporter uh, that we use for the analysis of TCR beta assays. So at a high level, the workflow uh, consists of uh, the standard primary analysis and base calling that we do uh, for all of our uh, applications. Uh, we eliminate low quality and off-target reads from further analysis. And the reads that we take through, uh, the first thing that we do with those uh, in the case of having used RNA as input is we uh, align them and we do some correction for indel sequencing errors. And this is where we leverage the property that I mentioned previously where uh, we're able to use the, uh, the, the fact that we have productive RNAs being sequenced and their lengths should be equal to a multiple of three, we're able to use that fact to identify uh, where there are likely sequencing errors and correct those. And the reason we can do this is because the primary error mode of the ion torrent system is to have insertions and deletions. Uh, and in this case, that's quite fortunate because 
those are readily identifiable as having as, as being present because they cause the length of the sequence to change. Uh, and so we're able to analyze the alignment and our knowledge of where our errors uh, are, are likelier to occur in the sequence to correct those errors as a result getting, uh, in the case of sequencing RNA in particular, uh, getting especially high accuracy on the underlying reads. Uh, the next step applies to, the remaining steps apply to both DNA and RNA as input, where we do uh, a step of eliminating errors that are induced during uh, PCR in the library prep itself, uh, where we identify if there are some clones present at very low frequency that are a very short edit distance away from a very high frequency clone. And in those situations, uh, it is much more likely that there has been a PCR error during the library step to create this very low frequency clone closely related to a very high frequency clone as opposed to that actually being a real event. Then lastly, we report out the clonotypes and we have some secondary uh, analysis exploratory features uh, that I'll describe in uh, the subsequent slides. So this slide shows a few of the different data views uh, that we provide. The one on the top left, the spectrotyping plot, this is a, an interactive plot that's available in Ion Reporter that captures broad information about the repertoire. Uh, the x-axis here shows the different V genes stratified by their location on the genome, and the y-axis shows the uh, CDR3 length. Uh, the size of the points plotted there is proportional to uh, the, the uh, number of clones, uh, and the points can be colored according to a variety of different metrics uh, of possible interest, including mutation rate, evenness, Shannon diversity, and so on. Uh, in the particular example that's being shown here at the moment, it's showing the evenness, and so you can see, for example, towards the left, a larger white dot that corresponds to one particular V gene uh, associated with a longer uh, CDR3 length in which there is a large number of uh, clones, and you can tell because of the very low evenness or the white color uh, that that is predominantly driven by uh, uh, one or a small number of clones really taking over and having been expanded. The plot on the top right is another way of summarizing the repertoire. This is showing the variable gene usage. So the x-axis here are the different v-genes, and the y-axis shows the number of reads associated with each v-gene. Uh, in the plot on the top, it's coloring the different bars there according to the variable gene allele. So this enables you to see the different allele usage. Uh, this is enabled by sequencing the CDR1 and 2 regions. The plot uh, below that, the lower right, is showing the same data on V-gene usage, except this time instead of coloring by V-gene alleles, uh, it's coloring the data according to the, uh, the, the clone. So for example, you can see in one of the, the, uh, the tallest bar near the left, uh, th there is a single, in the magenta color, a single very large expanded clone. Uh, then in the orange color, there is a second clone that is also fairly expanded, and then a series of lowly abundant clones in gray at the top of that bar. Uh, there's another couple examples of plots that we provide to help explore the repertoire. So the one shown here at the top left is showing the combination frequency between the V genes and the J genes. So again, the V genes are on the X axis, the J genes are on the Y axis, and the different colors uh, shown here correspond to the frequencies uh, in which those are found in the reads. And so you, the blue there corresponds to the lowest frequency, so you can see that there are some V genes that are essentially unused, uh, and then varying degrees of usage of different V and J gene combinations. And then lastly, we also provide a table of all of the clonotypes. So it shows, it shows on each row, uh, each clone with its variable and joining gene, the amino acid sequence of the CDR3, uh, and the underlying nucleotides that uh, comprise that amino acid sequence along with the count and frequency. Uh, and there can be benefits to looking not only at the amino acid sequence, but also at the nucleotides. 
because you can look for interesting phenomena like uh, convergence, where you see uh, multiple clonotypes with the same amino acid sequence, but different underlying nucleotide sequences. Uh, and phenomena like that will be the subject of one of our uh, future discussions in this series. So I'd like to move on now to talk about our Oncomine immune response research assay. So this is another assay that's intended for study of the tumor microenvironment. So this panel is a targeted RNA expression panel focused on just under 400 genes. Uh, when we designed this panel, we wanted to make it sufficiently broad to capture the composition of the tumor microenvironment, while at the same time keeping it sufficiently focused to enable high sensitivity. So in line with these goals, uh, we created this, uh, the content for this by carefully curating uh, multiple sources, so including over 200 relevant peer-reviewed publications. We took suggestions from key opinion leaders in the field. We uh, used public databases such as David for pathway annotation, clinicaltrials.gov for drug targets, and the Oncomine database for co-expressing genes as well as taking direct feedback from a number of drug developers on what they thought would be important content for this panel. The content of the panel can be broadly grouped into a few different categories shown uh, in, in the middle of the slide there. These include things like drug targets and genes involved in checkpoint pathways, markers of different type of immune cells and signaling molecules that inform B and T cell activation, tumor characteristics such as tumor antigens, proliferation, apoptosis, and lastly, we've included some housekeeping genes to provide sample or run quality control uh, and to use for normalization. And the, the key applications uh, of interest for this panel are use in studies of uh, mechanism of action, uh, discovery of novel biomarkers, and in providing rationales for uh, drug combination. So the, the fact that the panel is very targeted on just under 400 genes uh, is key enabling, in enabling it to be extremely sensitive. So unlike whole transcriptome approaches, there's very little sequencing throughput that ends up getting wasted on uninteresting, uh, highly expressed genes. And as such, it can capture genes such as interferon gamma uh, with very good sensitivity, uh, even though that gene is typically expressed at very low levels. Uh, the data shown in the plot here is comparing the immune response research assay with a whole, transcript, whole transcriptome panel on a subset of overlapping genes between the two uh, of key relevance for immune response. And as expected, because of the very targeted nature of this expression panel, the expression levels that we're detecting in terms of read per million for the immune response assay uh, are predominantly uh, higher. So lastly, I'd like to move on to describe the tumor mutation load assay. Uh, this is another assay focused on the tumor microenvironment, this time for characterizing the cancer cells uh, within the tumor microenvironment. So uh, tumor mutation burden uh, it has emerged in recent years as a biomarker of key interest. Uh, it's basically uh, an assessment of the number of somatic mutations present in a tumor genome, uh, often measured uh, or reported as the number of mutations in coding regions, sometimes also specifically focusing on non-synonymous mutations in the coding regions uh, of a tumor genome. And the reason why this is of key interest is that uh, in tumors that have high somatic mutation loads, uh, they are more likely to uh, generate neoantigens, and those neoantigens are more likely to be recognized by T cells and to generate an immune response. Uh, and it's been observed that there is a significant correlation in a variety of different situations between having a high tumor mutation burden and having a uh, positive response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies. Uh, the, the general idea there being that if uh, an immune response has already been mounted and, and suppressed, then unleashing it uh, may lead to good effect, good outcomes. So this uh, tumor mutation load assay that we provide, uh, like our other assays, it's part of a streamlined solution. Uh, it's ion seq based with automated library and template prep on the chef, on the ion chef system, and sequencing on the Gene Studio S5. 
Uh, it's a targeted assay that amplifies up uh, 1.7 megabases of the genome. Uh, it requires two AmpliSeq pools to achieve this. So at 10 nanograms each, that's 20 nanograms of input required. Uh, and it's provided, like many of uh, our other applications, with an integrated sample to answer solution that has optimized and pre-configured bioinformatics. So many of the initial studies on tumor mutation burden focused on use of whole exome sequencing uh, uh, to, to make the initial discoveries in relation to the relevance of tumor mutation burden. Um, that's been very effective, but in terms of broader and more routine application, whole exome sequencing is, uh, is somewhat unrealistic for a number of different reasons. Uh, the exome sequencing cost is still quite high relative to the cost of targeted sequencing. Uh, it has a higher rate of failure on FFPE samples. And it also, of concern to some, it pulls along with it a lot of uh, other irrelevant information in the form of variants of unknown significance. Targeted panels are typically preferred in, in clinical settings. Um, there's also, in the early approaches based on whole exome, a need to determine which variants are somatic variants by also doing whole exome sequencing of a matched normal sample so that germline variants can be identified in the normal sample and removed to reveal which of the variants are uh, somatic. Uh, but logistically, that's often very hard to put into practice, and so uh, a tumor-only approach is, is also preferred. So moving on, uh, this slide here is showing uh, the, the results of some in silico analysis that we did to demonstrate and convince ourselves that we didn't need something on the scale of a whole exome to be able to do accurate characterization of tumor mutation load. Uh, so here uh, are the results shown of an in silico study using over 21,000 publicly available exomes. Uh, and in the plot on the left, we're showing on the x-axis the exome mutation count from whole exome sequencing. And on the y-axis, the mutation count from our 1.7 megabase uh, TML panel. And as you can see here, there's very good correlation between the two. The plot on the left is summarizing all 21,000 exomes. And then in the series of plots on the right, it shows the same data, but just restricted to subsets uh, of different cancers. And so you can see here, you know, very good correlation between the focus panel and the whole exome sequencing uh, in, in a range of different cancers. In this slide, we further demonstrate the ability of a smaller targeted panel to replicate whole exome sequencing results. The slide summarizes data from three published studies that investigated genetic correlates to clinical response to immunotherapies in non-small cell lung cancer and in melanoma. These studies show that estimates of tumor mutation burden derived from exome sequencing were significantly higher in clinical responders compared to patients that didn't receive benefit from either anti-CTLA-4 or anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. As you can see in the box plots shown here for the three different studies we looked at, we observed, we observed a similar uh, uh, pattern of strong differentiation between the responders and the non-responders when we redid the analysis, restricting attention just to the regions that we target in the uh, tumor mutation load assay. So in every case, uh, the number of somatic mutations covered by the assay was significantly higher for the responders uh, relative to the non-responders. Uh, and, and this result, too, suggests that the assay is sufficiently large to support clinical research into the genetic correlates associated with response to immunotherapies. This slide shows how our assay can operate without the need for a matched normal sample. So after calling variants in the tumor-only sample, we implement a series of filters, primarily leveraging comparisons to public databases of common variation, including you know, uh, the, the 1,000 genomes, 5,000 exomes, UCSC common SNPs, and the EXACT database. Uh, and we use those to remove germline variants. The plot on the left shows a before and after view of the allele frequency distribution in a tumor-only sample. So on the left is the allele frequency distribution that we see before applying filters to remove germline variants. And on the right, you can see uh, the much lower allele frequency distribution, as you would expect, uh, from the somatic-only variants. 
the plot on the right compares the mutation counts in the tumor-only workflow uh, shown on the y-axis with the mutation counts from a workflow that compares tumor with its match normal shown on the x-axis. Uh, and as you can see, there's very high correlation between the two approaches. Uh, lastly, on the TML panel, uh, the data being shown here are from a study done by Jose Carlos Machado in Alpatimup in Portugal. He used a collection of colorectal samples, uh, colorectal cancer samples, which have been previously characterized with respect to their microsatellite instability status. And he profiled those same samples with the tumor mutation load assay. Uh, now, microsatellite instability is a biomarker that is known to generally correlate uh, with tumor mutation load in colorectal cancer, cancer. So we're pleased to see here the high degree of differentiation that you see in the box plots between the mutation count distributions in the MSI positive and the MSI negative samples. So lastly, I'd like to provide a couple of examples that show how the four assays, uh, some of the four assays that I've just gone through in the previous slides uh, can be used together uh, for the study of cancer immunity cycle. So the first example is going to involve comparing the TCR repertoire and gene expression in the tumor microenvironment. But first, before stepping into the example, I wanted to share a study that we did comparing the repertoire seen in the tumor microenvironment and that seen in peripheral blood. So in this study, we took RNA from peripheral blood leukocytes and RNA from a lung tumor uh, in a single individual. Uh, and we ran them both through uh, TCR beta, uh, the TCR beta long read assay and compared the repertoires that we saw with each other. Uh, so that's what's shown in the right, the comparison between the repertoires. And on the left, we see a summary of what was seen within each. So uh, within the tumor biopsy, uh, the repertoire was much smaller uh, and much less diverse. Overall, an oligoclonal repertoire, Shannon diversity of just under seven uh, and just under 600 unique T cell receptors seen. By contrast, in the blood, we saw over 45,000 unique T cell receptors, so very diverse and rich repertoire, Shannon diversity close to uh, 14. The plot on the left, or on the right side, uh, compares the two with each other, uh, and, and clearly many of the clones are unique to the much more diverse uh, peripheral blood repertoire. But a substantial fraction of the clones that were found in the tumor microenvironment were also detected in peripheral blood. So this supports the notion that the study of peripheral blood can be informative uh, about the tumor microenvironment. So moving on to that first study, uh, the question of interest here uh, that we were looking at was to see if we can identify immune cell co-infiltrates that influence T cell function in the tumor. So just before diving into the data, I'd like to first review uh, the concepts of evenness and repressive and uh, permissive tumor microenvironments. So evenness is a metric of the repertoire that we often use. Uh, this metric helps to understand if, the T cell, if there's a T cell immune response within a sample. So evenness values range from zero to one. One represents a perfectly even population of T cell clones where all are present at the same frequencies. And that's what you might expect where there are no clones that are responding to antigen. Uh, uh, conversely, in the case of a clone uh, responding to antigen and being significantly expanded, you would expect to see an uneven repertoire uh, and a much lower value of evenness. So this evenness metric is useful in the context of the tumor microenvironment in that we can look at it to help us understand if the tumor is repressive or permissive to an anti-tumor T cell response. So in a repressive tumor microenvironment, the tumor is somehow inhibiting an anti-tumor T cell response. And in this scenario, one would expect to observe high evenness values following TCR immune uh, repertoire sequencing. By contrast, in a permissive tumor microenvironment, the tumor allows for T cell expansion and some anti-tumor activity. And in this scenario, one would expect to observe low evenness values following TCR immune rep sequencing. So we uh, use this uh, to study the question, 
if you can profile the T-cell repertoire in the tumor microenvironments and study it in the context of other co-infiltrates that may influence T-cell function in the tumor. So to that end, in this study, we interrogated the tumor microenvironment of 19 non-small cell lung cancer samples. Uh, we started with fresh, ro fresh frozen tissue biopsies, and we ran them on the TCR beta long read assay and on the uh, immune response uh, expression assay. So the violin plot on the left-hand side here is showing the, uh, the evenness across the, different, uh, the 19 different samples. And you can see here that most of them had fairly high evenness values uh, uh, corresponding with uh, uh, permissive environments, and a small number had very uneven uh, uh, repertoires. To understand why the T cell populations uh, are highly even and why some are, are, uh, are not, we correlated the T cell evenness with gene expression data from the immune response assay, and that's shown in the plot on the right where we look at the overall correlation of different categories of genes. And here we observed uh, a very strong negative correlation between T cell evenness and the expression of genes important for proliferation. And we observed uh, a strong positive correlation between T cell evenness and the expression of myeloid suppressor cell signatures. So this suggests that the myeloid suppressor cells uh, may be involved in suppression of an immune response. So this is an example here of how uh, the extent of T cell expansion, when looked at together with the levels of repressive co-infiltrates, may together constitute a multidimensional biomarker that improves prediction of response to cancer immunothera immunotherapy treatment. The second example, oh, I'm sorry, the slides weren't advancing there. The second example uh, that I'm showing here comes from our collaborators in OmniSeq. They've combined the results from our immune response panel with those of our tumor mutation load assay and PDL1 immunohistochemistry, all run on the same sample and integrated into a powerful new predictive model, which they've trademarked as the immune report card. Uh, the results are extremely exciting in that the positive predictive value for tumors with high immune activation scores is over 90% as is the negative predictive value for immune, low immune activation scores. Uh, so that's what's shown in the results on the right there, where they did a study on almost 90 different uh, cancers from a variety of different tissues, and they profiled each through their uh, immune, uh, immune report card score to classify them as being either low, intermediate, or high in terms of their likelihood to respond to uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, and then within each of those categories, you can see the stratification between the responders and the non-responders. Uh, and as, as you would hope, uh, those that were categorized, categorized as high, uh, a large fraction of them, so over 90%, uh, were in fact responders. Those were, that were categorized as low, uh, a very large fraction of them, over 90%, uh, ended up not being responders. Uh, and then there's still a population in the middle uh, so about half uh, uh, of the overall, uh, sorry, about 25% of the overall samples ended up in this intermediate category where they were split about evenly into responders and non-responders. So that's certainly room for future improvements in the predictive ability to get more uh, predictions out of that intermediate category into the high and low. But overall, these are very promising results. And Omniseq believes that their immune uh, report card assay can become a standard uh, for predicting response. They're also working on uh, expanded versions of this model that factor in uh, TCR beta uh, repertoire results as well. So uh, in summary, I've shown you uh, uh, four of the different solutions that we provide for the study of immune oncology, our TCR beta long read and short read assays, our immune response expression assay and our tumor mutation load assay. Uh, and I've given some examples of how these can be combined together uh, to, to provide the basis of multidimensional uh, biomarkers. Uh, so these are, these are some more details, but I've run through these on the individual assays. 
uh, and then just to remind you, these are all available in the context of uh, our uh, Ion Chef and Gene Studio S5 systems, which have a high degree of automation, uh, which makes them extremely reproducible. Uh, the Gene Studio S5 itself is designed for uh, scalability and flexibility, so we have multiple different chips that can be used with a sequencer to tailor to the level of sequencing throughput that's necessary for however many samples uh, need to be analyzed and what the read requirements are uh, on, on that particular day. Uh, and the sequencing, one of the strengths of the sequencer is its speed. Uh, the sequencing and the analysis uh, all happen extremely fast. The sequencing itself takes on the order of two and a half or less hours. Uh, and these are provided in the context of full sample to answer solutions. We have pre-configured and optimized bioinformatics uh, to get you all the way from sample through to uh, answer. And then lastly, uh, I'd just like to give uh, an advance notice that we will have some follow-up presentations to this one, where my colleague, Dr. Tim Looney, will give uh, two more talks that are going to go into more detail on uh, some of the assays that I described here. Uh, so the first one will focus on the TCR beta long read assay, and the second will focus on the TCRB short read assay. So those are coming up on August 16th and on September 12th, uh, and the link shown here uh, can be used to get into more detail on that. And lastly, all of the work that, we, uh, that we've shown here uh, is, is really uh, fitting very well with Thermo Fisher Scientific's mission to enable the world, uh, our, enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Uh, it's a mission that we're uh, all very proud of here. So with that, I'd like to close and uh, turn it over for questions. Thank you, Dr. Colley, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how many samples could be pulled together on 520, 530, and 540 chips? So that answer is going to depend on the assay uh, that you're using. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, it's, this is one of those answers where it depends. Um, you know, I've talked through a range of different assays and a range of different applications here. Uh, and in some of them, uh, it's going to require, you know, the, the, the goal of the experiment to be examined to decide how much throughput is necessary. Uh, you know, so for example, with the TCR beta sequencing, for applications like uh, minimal disease detection, uh, the sensitivity that you're going for, one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, is going to have a huge uh, effect on the number of reads that, that you're going to need for that. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that, that's, that's maybe the, the short answer, uh, and we can perhaps follow up offline with, with the full detailed information of what the uh, multiplex level is on the different chip types for different kinds of applications. Now, Dr. Colley, our, our next question is, uh, is a two-part question. Ion Reporter software seems to be the analysis software of choice. Is this something that comes with the system, or do we need to purchase it separately? Is this a third-party software? So the Ion Reporter software is a software that uh, we've developed in-house, uh, and you know, the, the, we, we use it to make available a series of workflow, workflows that are pre-configured and optimized to the different applications that we support. Uh, it's, the software is available uh, for free in the cloud. Uh, it's also available for people who wish to run it locally. Uh, it's available in a local server edition, which requires the purchase of uh, a, a server from us to, to run it on. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's in-house software in terms of third-party software. Uh, as I mentioned during the talk, uh, we do also make it uh, straightforward for people to get data out of our system so that if they wish, they can also run it through other third-party packages of, of their choice. And our, our next question is, will you have any assays that address B-cell repertoire? 
So uh, the assays that we have available so far for immune repertoire sequencing are exclusively for T cells. Uh, we are definitely interested in uh, B cell repertoire sequencing. Uh, and while we have no products available for that today, it's, it's something that we may do in the future. Now, it looked like we may have had a little bit of technicality, but uh, because the slides do not advance past slide 31, would you happen to be able to review slides, re, excuse me, review slides 32 and 33 for us? Sure. So uh, that was related to the study on uh, non small cell lung cancer, uh, where we were using the immune repertoire. Uh, the, the, sorry, the uh, TCRB long read assay and the immune response expression assay together on the non-small cell lung cancer samples. So this was, I think we got stuck uh, on, on this slide that was just setting it up in terms of talking about permissive versus repressive tumor microenvironments uh, and how they have different T cell evenness. Uh, but the main result was this one here that is showing on the left the evenness values from the uh, repertoires on the 19 different samples, so most of them fairly high evenness. Uh, and then the main result is shown in the correlations on the right, which is showing the correlation between the T cell evenness and different uh, uh, expression signatures uh, shown on the right. So the, the correlation on the left side of that, the most negative correlation, is the one that shows the negative correlation between uh, uh, T cell evenness and uh, proliferation. And the rightmost one is, was the very positive correlation where evenness is highly positively correlated with the myeloid-derived uh, 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 suppressor cell, uh, which is the result that's you know, suggestive here, that it's the myeloid-derived suppressor cell that is involved in uh, causing and suppressing the response and resulting in an even and, and thus repressive environment. And Dr. Kali, it looks like we have time for one more question. Is there any overlap in the content from the Oncomine TCR beta L, uh, long read and the Oncomine TCR beta short read assay? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they are essentially both amplifying up uh, overlapping regions in the in the T cell receptor. So the long read assay works only on RNA and it's amplifying up a longer region that includes CDR3 but also CDR1 and 2. Whereas the short read assay is uh, also operates off of RNA and can also work on DNA uh, and it amplifies up just CDR3. So so the content that both of those panels uh, do amplify are, you know, one is a subset of the other. The, the, you know, one of the primary uses of the short read assay is to be able to uh, use short amplicons, which enables it to be used with FFP samples, which are, you know, by far, by far the most common type of uh, sample available for uh, clinical oncology work. And the downside of working with FFP samples is that the DNA and RNA are typically very degraded, and so uh, our amplicon-based approach needs to use short amplicons to be compatible with that. The, the long amplicons would not work. Thank you again, Dr. Colley. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, no, no more comments other than just to thank everyone for their time uh, and interest in this topic, which is one that greatly excites us. So uh, thank you very much, and I wish you a good day. We would like to thank Dr. Colley for his time today discussing how the cancer immunity cycle can be deciphered utilizing the next generation sequencing technology. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of the registration. At the end of this webinar, you will be redirected to the registration page for our second webinar in our three-part immuno-oncology series titled, Advancing Precision Immunotherapy Through Next Generation Sequencing of T-Cell Receptors, presented by Dr. Timothy Looney. This live webinar is on August 16th at 8 a.m. Pacific time.
This webcast can be viewed on demand through February of 2019. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We hope to see you August 16th. Until next time, goodbye.